Welcome to another video. In my first video, I spoke about what's the point. In other words, what's the point to creating this YouTube channel? In this video, I'd like to expand it a little bit more in the context of what's the point in me wanting to create content, whether it's for this channel, writing novels, creating photographs, why do I do that? Now, before you run away, just give me a couple of moments, please. I think it'll be worth a listen to, and hopefully if you're in a rut and you struggle sometimes to figure out what motivates you to want to create your photography or whatever it is you create, listen to my story and maybe it'll help you. A little over 10 years ago, my first novel, A Beautiful Song, came out. It's about a guitar player, Dylan James. A few months after it was published, someone came up to me at a sporting event and thanked me for writing the book. And I said, why? Now, granted, I knew this person. I thought, well, maybe he's just trying to be nice. So that's why I asked, well, why? And he said, because whenever I get in a bad mood, I open up my phone and I read a couple of chapters and it makes me smile because I see a lot of myself in Dylan, the main character in the book. And so when I read about him, it helps me get in a better mood and I can go back to work with a smile on my face. And so I thanked him and, you know, we moved on. Now that wasn't really the reason for writing the second book. In fact, even in writing the first one, I wasn't motivated by, oh my goodness, I have to write the next great novel. It, it just wasn't in me at that point in time to do it. Maybe I'll do another video as to why, but somebody bet me I couldn't write a novel. It wasn't the motivation I needed even to write a second one. It was nice and it helped, but it wasn't the main reason. In fact, at that time, the reason why I continued on was because after I wrote the first one, then I set a goal for myself to write 10. Don't ask me why 10. It was just a goal I set for myself. So at that point, I still didn't have this giant need to go out and write more novels because I had something inside me saying I need to get it on paper. It was really just a goal I set for myself at the time because a lot of people told me, you can't do it. Well, so I thought I'd prove them wrong and try to do it. Then everything changed in late April of 2017. I used to coach sports and I would walk miles pretty much every day. And I wasn't in the world's best shape, but I was in, for my age and all, I was in decent, decent enough shape. And one day I went out for a walk and I got about two blocks and I was exhausted. I didn't know what was wrong, but I couldn't take another step. I almost thought I was going to have to call for help just to get back to my house, which was only two blocks away. And it took me probably 20 minutes for me just to go back those two blocks. I could only walk a few steps, stop, walk a few steps. Finally, I got inside back in the air conditioning, cooled down. I thought my head was going to explode. I turned bright red, I was putting ice packs on my head, the whole thing. I had a terrible headache and I knew, well, it's more than just the flu or something like that. I, something was wrong. So the next morning I went into a walk-in clinic. My wife was out of town at the time. The doctor hooked me up to a couple of machines and looked at me for a couple of minutes. And he said, you need to go to the hospital right now. You're in danger. Go to the hospital right now. He said, I should call you an ambulance, but it's only a couple of blocks down the street, so if you promise me you'll go there right away, I'll let you drive there. I was, knew I wasn't feeling well, but I was kind of stunned by that news. So I did. I went to the hospital. And I spent three days there, and they're looking me over, and they almost sent me home a couple of times. They couldn't find what was wrong. They thought, well, it was angina or something else, but they couldn't find anything 
really wrong with me. Finally, they decided to do the test where they go up your leg into your heart and see what's, what's really going on. And when they did that, they found out that I was 90% blocked in just about every area that went to my heart. And the doctor said that he had no idea how I was even functioning as a human being. He had no idea how I didn't have a stroke, how I didn't have a heart attack. There was just no way I should still be walking. So I was next in line for heart surgery. The next morning, I had a triple bypass. I was supposed to have four, but uh, something happened and I had a triple, triple bypass. And it was a successful surgery. A couple days later, I went home. A few days after being home, I went back to the surgeon and his uh, assistant looked at me and I was telling him that I was having a hard time breathing. And I, I didn't feel as well that day as I had even two days earlier. And he blew it off and said, oh, don't worry about it. This happens to a lot of patients. You'll be fine in a couple of days. The next morning, I had a healthcare specialist who was coming over to check on me. When she knocked on the door, I couldn't even get out of my seat to go let her in. I, I couldn't move. So I called her to come in. She opened the door, came in, took one look at me and said, you need to go to the hospital right now. Right now. We called my wife, she called my cardiologist, we ran over to see him. He didn't think there was anything wrong with me at the time, but he said, just to make sure, let's send you over to the hospital, do some tests and see what we can come up with. About an hour later, they, I was in the hospital, they, ran, they did an MRI. A few minutes later, they put me back up in my room. And soon after that, a nurse came in and said, would you like to speak with the, the hospital chaplain? I'm thinking, why? So I said, no, why, why, would I need to do, why would I need to do that? She said, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but you're not gonna be here tomorrow. You need to make peace with your maker now. You won't be here tomorrow. And you know, when somebody hears that, I uh, was kind of taken back and I thought, well, no way. I mean, I don't feel good, but come on. Soon after that, doctor came in and I asked him what was going on. And he said, well, we've talked with a bunch of specialists here. We have an emergency team coming in and we need to put you in surgery right away. And I said, why? He said, because you have blood clots in your lungs and if one shakes loose, it's over. And the odds of one shaking loose is pretty high. Maybe, I don't know, half hour, hour later, I'm back in the operating table. They were um, putting medication in my lungs on the clots to try and dissolve them before one could break and get into my heart or my brain or whatever they were afraid of. And it was one of those surgeries where they put you in like a twilight state where they talk to you you're kind of half out but they're talking to you and i could feel myself slipping in and out they kept saying stay stay with me stay with me stay with me we got through the surgery and i was strapped to a board for the next i don't know so many hours 15 20 hours in intensive care i wasn't allowed to move i'm not even supposed to move a finger i was really strapped to the bed so then the next morning they went in, I had another surgery where they put a little, I call it my clot catcher, in my chest so that if one of the clots did break loose, it would hopefully break it apart before it could get too far into my system. And I still have it in there to this day. I don't think I've had clots since then. I'm sure it was because of the surgery as to why I was throwing off blood clots they had given me about a 2% chance to survive all that. Here I am. When I think about, well, why? What's the point? Because I, I still, even though it was back in May of 2017 when I had all these issues, and I'm, I'm fine now. I mean, I can walk and, and uh, go just as far as I could probably 20 years ago. I can't run but I, I can walk and do things and carry weight and, and do all those things. Um, so I'm, I'm fine. But still, I think about 
well, why me? Why did I survive that? You know, what, what's the point of me still being here? And I'm sure that there's a lot of reasons why the good Lord saved me. It can't be to do harm. It can't be to be one of these lunatics that goes around shooting up people or, or uh, hurting other people. It, it couldn't be for that reason. So it must be to help people in small ways. If I can create a photograph and put it on Facebook or Instagram, whatever, and somebody smiles and says, hey, that made my day, thanks. Or write a book and somebody says, hey, I read your book, it put me in a good mood, it made me smile. It could be that you know, I was supposed to create this reef tank behind me because my grandsons love it. Maybe one day one of them's going to be a marine biologist and discover something. I only know I am still here and there must be a reason. That's my motivation to still want to create things. And I know until the day I'm gone, I'm going to want to create things. And if it's a video on how to remove haze from your photographs, or how to turn something into a watercolor, or whatever it is, whatever I end up creating in the future, write another novel. Whatever it is, if someone, if one person a day get some joy out of that. I have to assume that's why I'm still here. That's the point. So I'm sure there's a thousand little reasons why I'm still here. And so when you have trouble figuring out what motivates you, Think about how it affects others. Or even if it only just affects you. If it puts a smile on your face by learning something new, by creating a photograph you didn't think you could ever create, by writing a poem you thought you could never write. If that puts a smile on your face, that should be enough to motivate you. Thanks for listening.